inspiring everyone this afternoon. I have three messages for you today, and uh, that I'm going to try and to have explained at the end. Now I'd like to just put everything on the table from the start, so that if you're not interested anymore, at least you, you, you know my three points. So the first point I have is that I think in order to fully automate data integration, you need to use data. The second point is that talk before this for those of you who are here was about uh, about your next API will be that driven. I also follow that paradigm. I think that will be necessary in order to get materializable views, materialized views to get that all uh the third part is shout out towards the uh, everything that's happening right now at the European level on data spaces. I truly that will be will, will be able to bridge the gap between the vision that I have, which comes from my background in, in open data, which is of course not that enterprise, you know, in, in enterprise you first and foremost needs a well-established trust between parties before you do data share. I think data spaces will add that to what's uh, this vision. But um, first, okay, I think the battery died of this clicker. Um, or not, okay. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to point you to uh, where you are. You are in, in Brussels at this moment. And I don't know if someone knows what, what that place is over there. Uh, yes, I'm coming back to that one. I was going back around from the first slide as well. Was yes, the, the, the other one was the, was the arrow over there. Yes, yes, I've heard the right, uh, the right answer. It's Bokre. <laughs> and, and I truly love Bokre, an open, an, an open air museum uh, for crafts where you can really visit how people did things pre industrialization. Now, coming back to the most beautiful city in the world, to Ghent, that's the place that I'm from. And in Ghent, we have a museum of industry. The Museum of Industry really tells the story from the, the part of industrialization, what happens after the Bokrek, yeah, then, then, then what happens ah, after well, there's, there's one really nice thing on, on, on display there. Uh, it's called the, the, the Mule Jenny. And the, the Mule Jenny was one of the first uh, uh, things that really changed how we did, uh, how we, uh, how we did uh, the, the textile industry. Uh, in Flanders in Europe, on the, uh, because it was actually first set in the UK, but in the UK. So now they, they brought it to the, to the uh, uh, to, to Flanders uh, for the first time in 1810. Uh, that one you can still, still visit. But it's also um, uh, one of the, the, the first yeah, things that really changed how we did, uh, how, we, how we performed our industry and we uh, boosted our, uh, our economy in that, uh, in that thing. So that, that's, uh, uh, that, that's really interesting. Let's talk about data integration, right? And in data integration, I like to, 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 to use the image that at this point, you're really bothering. In data integration, you need to tell a developer to really do a lot of manual labor in order to integrate one data set. However, I do believe that we can fully automate the tasks that that developer is doing. And I hope that we can automate that, because if we can automate that, then we are going to see a whole world. Growth. And we're going to see a world where, where we can just set up an application and say, like, just integrate with the web, and that automated data integration should be able to happen on your uh, machine, taking into account trust and so So the, this is something that, that, that we're looking at. Because what do we have today? Um, Today we have what I like to call the long tail of data integration. If you're going to set up a project, you're going to say, okay, look, for this project, let's say a root banner, you're going to build the root banner, and for that, I obviously need a rows network. So I'm going to put in the efforts to integrate a rows network panel. However, the road network is not the only thing that you need. For example, you also need uh, public transit time signals. You also want to integrate with, with uh, this public transit. So you're also going to put in that effort. That's not only one data set, already just for Belgium, it's already uh, uh, four data sets, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, and you keep adding other data sets, like uh, oh, the, the, the water taxi, is that also a public transit? Yes, of course, you, you, you put it in there. 
Uh, and then you may, may start thinking about data sets that have less value to your root, root pattern, but still are kind of relevant, can provide a certain, uh, certain uh, experience for part of your uh, target group. For example, wheelchair accessibility. One of the, the, the things that I believe every root pattern should have, because that way also you're, you're inclusive towards uh, about 10 percent, just if I that's a statistic, uh, about 10 percent of people that that, that, that may uh, have uh, or, or maybe may benefit from uh, from uh, uh, that kind of accessibility information. So uh, so so at a certain point you're going to set up your your project on a, on a certain budget. At a certain moment you're going to have to cut the long tail. You're going to have to cut an entire niche market that that, that otherwise you wouldn't serve. But uh, but. Uh, uh, but uh, at this, uh, yeah, so so that's uh, because of the cost of data integration, that's uh, now we won't be able to integrate anymore. And this is like the goal. And if you have automated data integration, I want to see the entire tail until it infinity. I want to see that in, uh, in blue as adoptable uh, for your uh, for your uh, and uh, at the heart of this, this is uh, how we develop today against the uh, against the lab. Is that uh, we, we first and foremost take a lot of uh, uh, spend a lot of effort here trying to get our end user device to work with our database through a certain architecture where you do uh, you set up your API and so on and then I have by the way dear developer uh, make sure that uh, the road network is in there ah and by the way also the public transit network and almost this part this ingestion parts and integration parts. Almost becomes an afterthought, like it's it's, it's forgotten. Like that, that's actually where the, where the biggest part of the work actually resides. It is it, it is open. So instead of, of focusing so much on, come on, yes, uh, um, I am feeling the hard right Yes. Um, so instead of trying to, to to solve that problem over there, how can we actually? Trying to solve that problem over there, and maybe this part isn't won't be necessarily at all anymore. Maybe this part can just be a client a client side SDK. Maybe it can be just a client library that tries to traverse the web, uh, uh, looking for uh, looking for the right information. Maybe we can use the web as a database. I will I will have a couple of demos in this presentation that shows that point, and the fact that we can really now think about this. As an end user device performing the query, you can also equally as well just put it on server. So, our points about, yeah, but I, I, I really want to use that integration to do something over here. Yes, okay, that's interesting. But of course, first and foremost, uh, uh, first and foremost uh, uh, thing that we want to do is over here make sure that we can traverse the web looking for information that will give an added uh, value to our use case. How do we do that? Well, I want to introduce to you linked data because I think it's a concept. Once you know it, you know it, and it's quite simple, but you need to know it. And it's everywhere, I think, but if you don't know it, you won't see it. This is three times the same data set. If everyone agrees with that, it's once in XML, once in JSON, and once in CSV. If you understand one of them, fine. Now, what do we do? As, uh, as, as uh, I'm an academic, so academically, you try to you try to look at this data and say, okay, what's now the real data facts in there? And then you use the, the, the theory from Noam Chomsky, in, uh, uh, the, the, the generative uh, uh, grammar, uh, of course, and then you say, okay, something must have a relation to something else. And this is something that we try to get out of this. Like, how can we now, from these things, make sure that we can understand what the statements are? How does something has a relation to something else? And uh, over here in the CSP example, you, you, uh, you will be able to see that uh, St. Peter's Square over here has a type of parking. And just now you see that I'm making a triple movement. And then something has a relation. Go on. Yeah, that's all I have to stand over there. Um, uh, but uh, something always has a relation to, uh, to, to something else. And this is then in each of these examples, how you can extract facts from it. And this is also what, uh, what, what the developer manually would do when they do data integration. What they would do is they would look at, this, at any kind of data and they would say, okay, what's the subject of, of, of things? What are the properties attached to that subject? 
And what are the, 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 the attributes of, the, of this thing that, uh, that, that we need to talk about? And uh, whether you're speaking JSON, XML, or CSV, we just need a way in order to always, in an automated fashion, understand what the subject is of what we're talking about. We need to know the properties, and we need to know, okay, and what are now the actual values of these, uh, of the, of these things. And even the values or the, the object over here can still refer to something else uh, uh, as well. So that, that, that's it. And this way of, 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 of thinking, because, because uh, this is introduced by the Resource Description Framework, or RDF, or just in short, the ID behind link data, allows you to extract triples from any kind of serialization. So any kind, and that's a bit exaggerated. I'll show you some, some examples later. Um, but the first thing is, OK, I want to be able to extract these triples. The second thing, of course, with the data is the fact that huh, we want to be able to decentralize. We want to be able to make sure that this uh, uh, this data, these triples, can be um, can be maintained by the right organization. For example, what I what I think is that uh, St. Peter's Square type parking that that should be that, that should be maintained by the mobility company of Ghent. So the, the, the administration that's, that's responsible for, for parking information. St. Peter's Square uh, is in the city of Ghent. Uh, I think that should be maintained by the address registry of planners, because they're actually tasked to, to, to be the authoritative, the, 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 the real data set. If it's not in the address registry, the address doesn't exist. So this street name would only exist if it's actually in that, uh, in that source. So I would like that. Uh, I would be able to get that triple from Clovers. And Gap has a population of 257,000 inhabitants. That's uh, something I found just on Wikipedia. Now the question is, can we actually decentralize that? Can we actually do something like this? Because these triples, whatever serialization uh, they're in, I don't, I don't care. They should be able to be put in any kind of serialization. Uh, I want to be make sure that if they're published on one of these uh, uh, machines, that I still can, as a client, as a user agent, but I can, still can bring them together and still uh, uh, get more uh, knowledge from that. Yeah. And someone visiting all these machines independently, or a machine visiting all these machines independently, will be able to extract more information because it will be able to answer the question, give me all parking lots in cities with a population larger than 250,000. Right? As long as I can extract the tools. Although I'm lying, because the problem is not yet fixed, because I have a, I have a big problem over here. How do I know that Ghent over here is the same Ghent as what you're talking about in that other, uh, on the, on that other machine? And what if it isn't? And you're using the same string to, to, to describe, or the same word to describe that. What if it's referring to something totally different uh, than, than, than Ghent, the city that, uh, that, I, that I love so much? So, in order to fix that, there's a pretty easy solution. But uh, I know, of course, yes, St. Peter's Square can refer to the one in, in Vatican City, but it can also refer to the, 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 the square, and it can also refer to the parking lot. So which of these three is that St. Peter's Square? That's, that's important to be able to, uh, uh, to, to disambiguate that so that we have uh, kind of identifiers to make sure that we can point at the right thing. And how do we have a, a, a global dictionary of things on the back? Do we already have that? Something directly addressable? Like if I have a certain term, if I have a certain uh, identification of something, so I would be able to actually look it up. Does a system like that exist on the back? But actually, it is the back. The back has identifiers, URLs, you put them in your browser and you get an explanation of everything about that URL. So URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. What I now want is to extend that idea towards identifiers. Uniform Resource Identifiers, URIs. And URIs can refer to a document published on the web, a website, a homepage as well, but it can also refer to the real world things. So, if you're talking about St. Peter's Square, yes, uh, then actually the city of Ghent already provided a really nice uh, uh, URI for that, tax.ghent slash ID slash parking Peter. That's the official global identifier for parking lot, uh, for parking lot in, in Ghent. And of course, I, I, I was not lying, if you click it, 
you will actually be referred to a nice page about uh, St. Peter's Square. Uh, it's now a, a document, so I've been redirected, but the permanent link towards that, that I want that everyone uses in an identifier, uh, if they're talking about St. Peter's Square everywhere, is that, uh, uh, that identifier. And the same thing for the second part of the trip, in order to, to, to give a type uh, relation from one thing to another, the, the positive type is something that was standardized in 1999, uh, where you have a URI to give a type to something. And parking, uh, well, uh, uh, there is a schema.org. Uh, at schema.org, here you can find a, a whole vocabulary list, list of terms that you can use to describe. Uh, your world already. And schema.org, well, you might already know that for search engine optimization because you would put in a page some nice smart attributes in, in, in your page that would show Google, like, ah, look, this is about uh, a movie, or this is about a parking facility, or this is about something else. And this thing actually has opening hours. So if you then Google for that thing, that Google would know, ah, okay, this thing is a parking facility, it has opening hours, that would be a nice. Info, uh, info box next to it with structured data that you now can uh, uh, get. So that's the, that's the initiative for my schema talk, and where you may already know uh, linked data uh, uh, from. So uh, this is my idea. We need to use triples, and for every part of that triple, we just need to use your eyes, and, and all the problems will be fixed in the entire world. It's not my idea, it's the idea of linked data, the idea of linked data that has been around since actually the advent of the, of the web in uh, the first paper in 1989 of Tim Berkeley actually uh, uh, used a data mesh as, uh, as, a, uh, as a word for information mesh, that was the word uh, that I then, uh, then later changed it to web. Um, and, but it really contains the idea of, okay, you have documents, and these documents uh, uh, describe things in the real world, and they only can get linked, and look, uh, this is how you can, uh, can, can, can do it. Um, however, the adoption of it, well, I think everyone was more excited about the document part, because that was the immediately visible part. The automatable part, mm, that's just an afterthought in, in a lot of cases, until now. Until now, I think these same ideas from back then are uh, super valuable, and we need to get everyone to do this. And I think everyone is already doing it. We just need to see where, uh, uh, where it is. If you, don't, if you haven't seen it before, you will not uh, uh, recognize it. Um, first and foremost, there's a couple of uh, serializations you can use. This is uh, not JSON, but something I'm really fond of. It's, it's, a, it's a totally different serialization. It's called Circle. Uh, if you Google Turtle in data or Turtle RDF, you'll, you'll see this. But this is data which, which reads really well. It, it's like uh, just reading small sentences. Like uh, this is my personal identifier, and I'm saying that I'm a person, and I'm also an agent doing things. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a name, uh, and I know someone else, and uh, this presentation has been created by uh, my identifier, so this presentation. By me. And this is really something something I really I really like to use in my uh, data projects is using Turtle. There are many uh, parses around that can parse this kind of information. It really gives you access to the to the, to the Turtle based uh, form of, uh, of reading that. Should everyone use that? No, I don't don't think so. But uh, I really wanted to, uh, to show you this because I really like JSON. Ah, okay. And JSON we have a flavor of JSON called JSON LB, JSON Linked Data. That allows you to add uh, uh, all these kind of uh, triple white things uh, in it. You get a context in which you can map certain terms towards full URIs. So over here, uh, I map the word person towards a full URI for person and name uh, the same thing. I give my idea. I say, okay, this is my ID. This is B. I'm a person and I have a, a certain name. This is also linked data. You can parse it in RDF with a linked data uh, uh, library and it will work. HTML pages can contain linked data. You can map uh, linked data from, uh, from, uh, from projects like, uh, or if, if your data is not yet linked data and it does contain URIs and, uh, and so on, you can still use mapping language to add that data towards any kind of source using the RDF mapping language uh, uh, for your own uh, projects. And this is quite cool. Um, like uh, Netflix, for example, they uh, annotate their web pages in order to make sure that. Uh, uh, that uh, Google knows, uh, or even uh, everyone can can uh, get more information, a machine readable question uh, uh, about uh, about these things. So if over here uh, you just put in a URI of um, uh, uh, 
uh, okay, uh, some error appears, but apparently it's loaded, uh, is that over here you'll find some more information about, uh, uh, about that thing using, uh, using triples. So that's uh, uh, something uh, nice that you can start, uh, start using. And now really, are you really going to, to, to keep on going to talk about this like data thing? Nobody is doing this in the audience. Uh, actually, who's, who's already doing like data in the audience? Uh -huh. Some people know they are doing link data, other people maybe don't do link data, and other people maybe do link data, but people don't know it. So, so uh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, but I'm talking to the right audience if I really explain it on, on, on this, uh, uh, or introduce it uh, in, in, in this way. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, I do think that developers are really going to do that, and uh, I believe they are already doing that. Um, a really exciting open data project is uh, uh, OpenStreetMap. We really, really love it. The fact that we can just add things to our own public domain uh, uh, and, and add some more information uh, to, to, to certain things. Um, this is uh, uh, the node gets and features on, on OpenStreetMap. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, there are a lot of information on it. Um, but there's uh, a link here, uh, Wikidata, with, uh, with, with some kind of uh, identifier. Who knows Wikidata in the audience? Uh -huh. Okay, a very low amount, uh, which is interesting because uh, Wikidata at this moment gets more edits than Wikipedia. And this is how Wikidata looks like for uh, the, the station uh, against St. Peter's. Uh, and it's really a subject page. So you so you uh, so you take the identifier, that's the URI that uh, that, that they promote for for and features, and you just have a lot of information about it. Uh, as you can see, that uh, what kind of architecture it is, and so on and so forth. If you scroll down here, um, what you'll get is over here the fact that there's uh, the architect of uh, Gats and Peters is uh, Louis Coquet. Then you can see that this was uh, retrieved from uh, from id.fquid.net. And if you then visit that page, then you'll actually get um, uh, the, the URI inventories on the root of Actu, which is uh, the, the inventory of uh, uh, removable material. Is that that? Um, but, uh, but an official Flemish government website that actually annotates uh, or, or gives more information about guys and Peters. And they as well use over here URI, and you can get more information, can get more, uh, more images. Uh, so that's already interesting. You can do stuff in the cultural heritage domain. Everyone excited? Cultural heritage? But uh, uh, there's more. Uh, uh, if you if you scroll down uh, uh, here, you'll also find the station code with a reference towards the European uh, base registry. There's a European base registry that is uh, collecting all the information on railway infrastructure in Europe. So uh, Infrapal, Prorel, Deutsche uh, Bahn, SNCF, so they all need to put in all their data into an, a European uh, base registry that, that, uh, that uh, makes sure that all the uh, railway tracks are uh, visible, the, all the operational points that, that we have a good view about that uh, all across uh, Europe. If you visit that page, you'll get a very, very ugly page, but hey, this is not for people, this is for machines. Uh, where you can actually get uh, more information about the, the geometry, where you can get uh, some operational uh, types and so on. So if ever uh, there's there's um, uh, there's not a use case where you need to combine cultural heritage with uh, operational railway infrastructure data. Okay, that is not the case. Maybe not really a use case yet, but if there would be a use case, it would be possible. And this is something that I the point I want to make is that at the long term, like I don't know how how long the, the, the effort is that you want to invest uh, in, in, in actually getting that data on board. If it's possible, why not? If it's possible, you will you will make sure that there's a whole new world of data integration projects that uh, that, that, uh, that will be in plan. But uh, okay, these two examples not much yet. But if you uh, scroll. Uh, uh, Okay, so over here, um, uh, what we'll get is that uh, uh, you'll also uh, get a uh, identifier to irl.pe slash stations uh, with, with a certain identifier on it. 
If you would uh, uh, click that, you would immediately get the uh, 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 so we go down and there's a lot of information about uh, Gans and Peters here. If you click the link, you immediately get the real time departures at uh, Gans and Peters as well. So if now you want to build a route plan where you pass by all the uh, all the stations that were built before uh, before a certain before 1950, for example, uh, then you'll be able to actually now build it because everything is linked, and you'll be able to uh, to start uh, start uh, going. So this uh, this just as an example of uh, Wikidata is a really nice entry point if you want to start discovering data if you want to uh, uh, move forward uh, uh, in, in in the linked data domain if you want to uh, start using your eyes start from uh, from uh, from Wikidata and you're going to find a lot of links to other projects that you might find surprising and that is this is also immediately the goal behind it is the reuse of uh, data sources uh, uh, data sources online. And uh, in order to, to, to reuse data models, this is something that, uh, that uh, the Flemish government is, is, is investing heavily in. It's uh, called uh, Open Standards for uh, Linking Organizations, which you can find at data.flemish.de and uh, over there if you want to get active with, uh, uh, with certain, uh, yeah, like publishing some data within the, 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 the data space that, that, that uses that. Well, over here uh, in the vocabulary, you, you can find all the terms that, uh, that are being used in a, in a, in a functional perspective. So that's the idea of linked data. So one, uh, make sure to use, uh, uh, use to, to have a way in which you can extract triples from your data, because that way you know what has a relation to something else. Two, we will use global identifiers. So using these global <laughs> identifiers, we are certain that, uh, that we are for sure, talking about the thing with that, uh, uh, that definition, and we won't clash, uh, we, won't, uh, we won't have conflicts in, uh, uh, in identifiers this way. This is the only thing that, that, that linked data is really doing. <laughs> All the rest is a lot of organizational mess, and the fact that uh, the organiza organizational mess of, uh, yeah, here, uh, 100 organizations, for example, how do we make sure that we build some census around what domain models we are going to use? And that's not different from, from any other uh, data integration project that we've already done. The only thing that I believe that, that we're going to do if we start using linked data is that we can uh, that we can start having this discussion in a more uh, automated uh, way. And if you have it, is that idea sufficient for fully automated uh, uh, data integration? That's also a good. Uh, a good um, uh, question because um, even if you have linked data, meaning a whole long list of triples, which may be in your JSON file, or which may be in, uh, in something else. So, uh, so if that's like the whole pile of, of, of triples that you have, the whole pile of data that you have, then what's the best API to publish that? Because yeah, in the, in the data domain, we, we do have a query language. It's called uh, Sparkle. Yeah. I haven't heard about that. That's fine. I also don't use that often in, in projects, but oh, it's quite powerful. It can, uh, can uh, support a lot of different kind of graph types on top of your data, similar to the Neo4j, how Neo4j does it on top of property graphs. Uh, although linked data is not exactly a property graph. But, uh, and it's also graph data, but, uh, uh, but it's not a property graph. So um, uh, over here, all the linked data experts that I know would say, uh, if you have a data set, not my not all that situation. Uh, I mean, some uh, linked data experts would say, uh, Sparkle is the best API. You should just uh, uh, put, put the Sparkle endpoints there, so that you can just also uh, put a query there and you'll get an answer. I compare that a little bit with, uh, yeah, like, would you do that for a relational database? Just, uh, just put all the uh, the, the, the read select queries that you can do in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a on a relational database, which you also put that public, you would probably think a couple of times and, and think very carefully about the loads that that's going to to uh, to, to, uh, to generate on, on your uh, on your database. Well, exactly the same for Spark endpoints. It generates loads, and uh, and I think it's it's a bad decision in a lot of cases. It's uh, uh, it's, it's mainly. Uh, an, an, a uh, solution to no problem and in the fact that nobody or, or well, only if there would be an app that really speaks the Sparkle language, then maybe it would be a solution. But 
you also have uh, uh, geospatial experts. Geospatial experts are they need OGC APIs, so Open Geospatial Consortium uh, APIs, uh, that define, for example, web feature services. Web feature services that are specialized to provide an API towards a, a, a GIS application. And this is something that, uh, that we've seen with the, with the address database in Plum. So I mentioned it, uh, there's an uh, on a regional level, uh, also in Brussels and Bologna, you have an address database that is the authoritative source of addresses. If it's not in the database, the address doesn't exist. It means that if you want to write something to the address, it means that you need to uh, have a permit in order to, to put a new, uh, a new address uh, on, a, on, a, on a certain location. Now, the address database, they uh, exist already for quite a long time, so they also have a history of, of setting up a lot of different uh, additional APIs. And right now, I think there are about at, uh, 17 APIs that are now uh, live and running. Uh, there's still some SOAP APIs from back in the days, and then, uh, uh, and then, and then a couple of uh, more recent APIs, and maybe a geospatial uh, service. Now they also have Sparkle endpoint. But then I asked them, oh, I have this very simple use case. I just want to do auto completion of the street names. Ah, that's right. I don't have it. Yeah. Don't guess. Uh, we don't have it. Um, so, in this kind of constellation, if you're publishing a data set or just sharing a data set with, a, with another person uh, or with a, an ecosystem, then you're always going to publish wrong, the, the, the wrong API. If you're going to do it that way, whether it's Oracle, whether it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, a very specialized open API, spider style API, it's always not going to contain the right features for what uh, your end users uh, want. And there's always going to be that extra feature that someone wants to build uh, in your And this is what I call the maintenance help, because this is also going to, to, to uh, put a lot of maintenance costs on the uh, uh, yeah. On the level of, uh, of the, the data. So, a, a very simple idea to, to, to change that around is to just say we're going to share a data dump. So, I'm just going to put all my triples, all my uh, link data in one file, and then I'm just going to, to throw it towards you, and you need to do whatever uh, you want with it. Actually, I like that idea from uh, the kind of uh, Okay, that was a point. Uh, my apologies. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this way you give full flexibility towards the users to do the querying exactly that they want. And you also make sure that your users, your data consumers, your, your clients will pay for the querying themselves, which is also the rights, the right location to be paying for. For CPU time that, that, that you set up. I, I, I. So, this is a nice idea. Although, with the address database, that also backfired a little bit because, uh, uh, because they also have now have a, have a data dump available for everyone, the CC format is quite cool to, to, to start playing with. Um, but, uh, uh, but you must know that there are 300 municipalities already in, in, in Flanders, that all of them they, they, they probably have a copy of it to, to set up their own. Uh, also, completion uh, functionalities, I, I would assume. Maybe not only one copy, maybe a couple of copies uh, scattered across, uh, across their, uh, uh, their own sub organization. And um, yeah, that, that, that also poses some, some problems because in 2019, there were, uh, we, we had 208, uh, 308 municipalities, but 300 municipalities, like Nepal, uh, Rotal, they are not out. Which also came with a couple of street name changes because yeah, some some uh, some, some street names gave some duplicates. Um, and what did we see is that uh, all these third parties they started to process all these small changes based on news articles locally. Which now we don't have one authoritative source of addresses anymore. We now have more over 300 uh, uh, copies uh, scattered all around the ecosystem. Uh, that of course may have uh, uh, problems. This is what I call the replication. A first idea in order to fix the replication, how, and this is uh, links back to the, to the previous talk, of course, as well, is event source. Making sure that we just don't uh, don't uh, get an event, uh, that we don't just have a data dump that we share, but that we really design our business events that we really try to, uh, to, to tell, look, my data set is a certain um, uh, is a certain uh, thing that contains business events that you will have to process. 
which means that if you go for event sourcing paradigm, that at least all these parties just by calling it even an events, uh, uh, event stream, that um, they're going to make sure that they always keep in sync with your development. So it doesn't become an afterthought anymore to stay in sync once there are uh, updates. Because a lot of people think an address interface, that doesn't change. Just uh, have a one-time integration. So then this, this kind of thing uh, helps with that. And on top of that, uh, an event sourcing architecture, oh, yeah, that actually scales also to very fast moving data. So we now have a uniform approach for fast moving data and slow moving data. So we need to have on top of there, in order to fix the reputation hell, we should just have a uh, event stream. But what is an event stream? And this is uh, when, when, when it uh, comes to, uh, to, to web publish. And we just decided, and, and this was a really interesting question that someone in the audience asked in the previous talk, like, oh, but how do web APIs relate to, uh, uh, to, 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 to event uh, driven design? And uh, I think, well, you know, it just, it just depends on how you look at it. And uh, you can also just model this data, model our triples as an event stream and say, like, look, uh, there's not an, uh, an address in there, but it's a um, uh, it's a, a, a new sweet name that, that has been added. So that everyone can code against the, 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 the events that are a new event stream, uh, a new street name has been added in the, uh, in the uh, suite. So that's really about actually just changing the words we use to talk about, uh, about uh, data publishing. And we created a very minimal specification called the Data Event Stream specification uh, that, uh, that does that, that allows you to put in one. Uh, one uh, file to just describe your entire event stream and publish it just like an RSS feed. Right. So you can, this combines the idea of one, link data, and triples, your rights, but then make sure that you describe your domain in events, and then just publish it as easy as possible in whatever serialization you prefer, but make sure that there's no way to make a way to extract the triples and make sure that you can from these triples, go that hey, this is an event stream, and these are the events that happen uh, quite, uh, quite recently. However, you can imagine that that becomes really big, and then, then of course, the, the, the idea is uh, we need to paginate somehow, we need to fragment our data sets somehow. And how are we going to fragment it? Because, uh, yeah, this is, yeah, well, maybe not fragment, maybe we should have advanced features on top of it, maybe we should publish it using a Sparkle endpoint. This is also, uh, again, uh, again, possible. Uh, the, the, the data dump versus the, the, the Sparkle endpoint is again possible if you just describe all your triples uh, with uh, uh, the So, um, so in order to make sure that uh, now with linked data event streams, that people don't have to uh, set up this database if they want to query the map, uh, the data event streams, and in this this uh, image, you still have to set up the API on the third party uh, uh, with, with the third party publisher. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that not everyone can just decide to set up a massive server and replicate the entire app, all the link data events, to, to just have them on top of your own uh, on top of your own system, so that you can have the API you want with uh, with with the full questions that you spent the past uh, years uh, uh, designing. Um, yeah. That won't work if you want to really uh, enable uh, an, an, a really long tail of, of, of data integration. So what do I want instead is that um, uh, is that we think of APIs as, uh, as, a, as an access. Some trade-offs on that access exist. Right? So, so uh, and, uh, I've been talking about two extremes, about either a full querying language that, that we put on the server, or if, uh, or just publish the, the uh, all the data and make sure that, that it gets uh, um, uh, gets consumed on the client. Eh? So over here, the clients do all the work, or there, the servers uh, do all the work. Question is, have we explored everything in the key? And this is something that I, I believe that as long as we have an event stream source, there will be intermediaries and data space, uh, the, the data economy, that will be interested in setting up the right versions of that data set that are more tailored towards a certain goal. And I think that can be achieved largely by uh, fragmenting data sets. Imagine that you have the, the address data. So I'll just use the address database uh, again as an example. And imagine that I want to do auto-completion uh, of all street names in group. 
And if I'm now doing the event source uh, approach, the, the address database is collected by your founders, that means that if there's no data in Bokre, then I will also get my, uh, and I will, will also get that uh, if, I, if I want to update my data set of, uh, um, uh, of proof. Now, what if we do geospatial trialing of that event? What if we geospatial trial it so that we can just say, okay, I just want to use these styles. And what if this, this styling is done in such a way that I even don't need to replicate anymore, but I can just fetch the data just in time to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to, to get the answers uh, uh, that I want. The first demo that I want to give is uh, a graph query because this is this is often a um, um, uh, yeah something that's that's uh, that's asked. Um, you can hear me through this one, right? Yeah. Um, often something that's uh, uh, that, that's being asked is um, uh, is a GraphQL like or a SparkQL uh, uh, like uh, question. Um, and what we can do is just fragment it based on um, uh, on some features in the uh, in, in the graph itself, so that an algorithm can understand that from the moment that you start from uh, from uh, from from one part of the event stream, that you can explore further the event stream by uh, uh, by getting data that uh, that uh, matches a certain uh, a triple pattern or a graph pattern. Um, yeah. So um, this is uh, uh, a query that happens against a triple pattern fragments interface. And a triple pattern fragments interface, what is that? Well, if we uh, look at it, this is this. And um, uh, what, it, what it does is just it creates a long list of all the triples in the event stream. Although, uh, uh, yeah, you can just, you only have the, the first 100, but you can just click next page to, to, to get the, the next one. But you can also filter on subject predicate object. Now, if you have a complex uh, uh, query that states that, ah, okay, I want to have uh, all the movies starring uh, a director, uh, star starring an actor uh, called Brad Pitt, uh, and I want the title of that movie, and I also want the name of the director. So uh, give me all the names of the directors of movies starring uh, uh, Brad Pitt. So if I execute this uh, using the triple pattern fragments interface, that's, yeah, it can be just a kind of fragmentation of your uh, of your initial uh, event stream but your client can be smart enough to say ah but i now will combine multiple hp requests in order to still answer that query on the client side and as you see the first time i did it it took 2 seconds to answer the second time to do it it only took uh, 43 uh, 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 it only took uh, a half a second why because uh, i have all the hp requests of course already uh, uh, cached over here. Feel free to play with query.linkdatafragments.org. It's the uh, one of the earliest ideas we had in order to uh, to make sure that we can um, um, uh, that, that we can yeah that we don't have to rely on the full server in order to answer the queries. But if we fragment the the event stream in certain ways, that we can have uh, faster answers to uh, certain queries. A second thing that I already introduced is the geospatial tiling uh, uh, of event streams. And uh, I have a, a demo uh, uh, over here that, uh, uh, what does it do? It connects to our version of OpenStreetMap in which we, uh, yeah, we, we geospatially fragmented OpenStreetMap and represented it as, uh, as triples. So that if you have an extent, so if your browser is open on this view, it will download the roads network for that, uh, for that area as linked data. Now, the second thing that we've done was we've made sure that uh, we also had uh, areas of interest, of uh, zones of interest, that uh, that are uh, that we uh, also compiled, which means that uh, if you do a route planning query from one point to another, that you also, uh, that next to downloading the right uh, roads network part, that you also use the zone of, zones of interest at the same time. So in that, uh, in that uh, regard, if that, uh, um, uh, in that regard, you can download the right data just in time to have client side root planning. So now it's not even a server that needs to uh, uh, to do that, but now it's also your uh, uh, client that, uh, uh, that that can do that uh, root planning. And uh, a last uh, uh, small demo that I have is that we can also use link data, uh, the link data event streams source to then say, okay, I want to set up an intermediary, but then I want to not have a pagination chronologically so that I can keep in sync with it, but uh, I want to set it up based on uh, substrings. So I want to set up everything that contains the letter A 
okay, I can descend the search tree in that way uh, in order to, 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 do, uh, to get that. It can also be, uh, uh, be described so that you can have uh, a client site, um, um, uh, yeah, client site uh, auto completion. So this is the streets of the Flemish address registry. And on intermediary server, we fragmented it on, uh, on substring. We still published the, 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 the linked data event stream, but we said, look, this is a materialized view. On top of that, that they'll always keep in sync with the with the, the streets of the Flemish address registry. And now over here, I can uh, uh, I can do auto completion. Um, uh, or I think is is uh, no. What's the uh, how long is this? Uh, so over here, this is the official identifier for uh, there are multiple Havenlands. So I'll, I'll need to check whether uh, whether what what the right one is. Uh, but um, uh, so over here, we found Havenland in Beringen, uh, uh, apparently. Uh, now, the cool thing is that uh, now not only does this work on one data set, now I can just include any other data set that I want and have fully automated the long term of data integration. For example, on my own website, I've showed you that I also have, sh uh, have uh, um, some linked data published. It's actually in the, oops, I did it twice. So uh, if you check my website over here, then uh, and if you go to the uh, source, then over here I put some JSON LD in order to describe myself and uh, uh, and to, to to add some machine readable data there. Um, so if we just now give it to uh, to an RDF uh, library like this one, oops, then it will uh, get some uh, triples about me. For example, that I. My name is Peter Volkwart, for example. Um, so if now we also test this uh, on, on, in this place. So, so we just put this uh, over here. And I'm looking for Peter Volkwart. Then you'll see that I have an identifier in the Flemish street name uh, registry, because there happens to be a Peter Volkwart stage in Ghent. Cool, eh? and, um, uh, and apparently Peter Kopart also exists on my uh, website. And this is now an autocompleter that I built by just adding new data sources on top of multiple data sets. Eh? So now the data integration, in order to integrate my personal website with the Flemish address registry, and I'm making totally clear, there's no business case at all there, but the fact that I can do it is the demo. The fact that I can show you, look, I can bring data sets together without any business model at all, because look, I don't even need a business model because data integration has been fully automated in this, uh, uh, in this demo. Um, oh yeah, and if you want to play with it, go to tree.linkdatafragments.org. Uh, you can also do some, uh, some uh, fun things like also with the, uh, there's some cultural heritage projects that we've worked on. There's some, uh, the, the, the European Railway Agency has added some data to it. There's uh, also the public transport stops in, uh, in, in Flanders, uh, the, the lane uh, bus stops are, are in there. So if you're looking for a street name or, uh, uh, or a bus stop, for example, this is uh, my, uh, my office uh, in, in, uh, in Ghent, uh, then you'll find both the street name, the identifier for the street name, as well as the uh, bus stop of there. Good. So what I want to get towards is first get linked data event streams uh, there, but then have an entire intermediary data space field, a data economy of specialized companies that build intermediary interfaces that are quickly findable. Because all these intermediary interfaces, if you build one as a data source, this is really archivable. Yeah, it's, it's built also for replication and, and, and synchronization. So this is, a, this is a, good, uh, a good idea. And all your functionality that you build on top of it, this way becomes, uh, can become file-based. So that's what I mean with materializable. It shouldn't be materialized, so you can also build it in a, as a virtual view on top of your system, but it can be, and therefore it's really good for, for, uh, for archivability. It's also great for evolvability because um, like, Today, we build applications against APIs, which I find a horrible thing to do. Why? Because if the API disappears, your app disappears. And wasn't it the entire idea behind, behind the uh, representational state transfer, behind REST, that ah, there's a loose coupledness in which, our, uh, in which our apps can automatically recover and can make sure that, that they can um, 
uh, that they can just find new ways in order to answer that question. Well, if there are 20 different views on top of my data set and all of a sudden one disappears, my client, my uh, Communica is decay over here, my Java based, uh, uh, JavaScript uh, based uh, client over there can, uh, can automatically find a new way to answer that uh, query. And also the query itself is not leaked towards the, the original data, which I also find a great thing for, uh, for privacy. Uh, there's another demo over here that uh, that allows you to just set up a GitHub action. To uh, that GitHub action will just replicate the, um, the uh, an LDAS on a, uh, on a schedule. Will republish the LDAS on GitHub actions uh, on GitHub pages, and will just make sure that uh, uh, that it exposes something like a substring fragmentation. So this way, if you have an event source of a data set on GitHub actions today with the linked data event streams actions, the LDAS action, you can just uh, automatically set, uh, set up a uh, auto-completion API uh, on top of that. Um, I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Um, I'll just point you to uh, still to, uh, if you still want to use um, the, the, the tooling uh, in order to start playing with, uh, with linked data event streams, there's now an entire uh, Flemish smart data space portal on which you can find a lot of technical documentation of how to set it up, how to start replicating and synchronizing, and how to build your own fragmentations uh, uh, on top of that. And also that quick shout out towards the fact that, ah, but Peter, that will work in an open data environment. You, you uh, existed, but it won't work with uh, an enterprise environment. Well, I think there we need to rely also, because if you just, on top of all these public uh, uh, data sets that I just showed, if you add trust, if you add authentication and authorization in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in a scalable way, you can apply exactly the same uh, techniques to your enterprise uh, architecture. Good. So my takeaways were uh, linked data is required to automate data integration. The event streams part with materializable views will bring this to web scale. And three, this data spaces uh, term that's now going on on a European level. That will bring, I think, the trust for enterprise uh, environments. And uh, if we all do that, then we will make sure that very soon we can set up a book rate for data integration. Like I would like an open air museum where you can see coders sitting and then uh, like enacting the way that we today are doing data integration by getting a JSON, trying to look, huh, what is this? What is it built even? And then, then trying to integrate it into our, uh, into our own system. I hope that we will be able to get the mule jenny thanks to uh, data spaces, link data, and event streaming. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Really interesting. I have a question. Let's say you want to use this as enterprise in a company. Now, developers and skills to people joining and so on. It's complex. Uh, a lot of APIs, data behind and so on. So, how you can take control about the group? What's the governance of this? Take control about so that you can scale with the API compliance behind. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that the governance in itself can also benefit from 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 big data and in, in, in assets. Like, uh, uh, like for example, if you talk about uh, about identity access control uh, and things like that. But today you can apply exactly the same API problems to, 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 that, uh, to that problem. It's like, ah, oh, that's identity, okay, is it, is it only something that's locally known to that, to that server, or can we extend it towards uh, can we decentralize it? I think for most is a good way of, 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 of looking at it, and uh, so there's a problem with it, goes and helps, of course, but uh, it's adapted everything. Um, so, uh, so, so I think that's just a combination of all these ideas. Everything you know already will be super valuable if you also uh, add this to your to your mix of uh, uh, things that are getting at the price rate. Uh, and there, there are actually already companies trying to roll that out. So that, uh, uh, for example, the, 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 I'll do some shout out of companies that you can use to do some of the uh, um, consultancy uh, uh, stuff. It's like uh, there's people from Tentpoles, which are a very good company. Uh, Red Pencil is also a great uh, company. There's uh, people right in, in the Netherlands uh, called uh, Tripoli. There's uh, Zazuko in Switzerland. There's uh, Ontopest in, in, uh, 
not sure where they're from. Okay. It doesn't matter, but uh, there are plenty of companies that really can help you with really these ideas of what that in uh, uh, um, so these uh, these data sets in tree that that you make uh, uh, to compare them with each other are these um, publicly um, available data sets that you actually create by making API calls, for example, to uh, a national registry searching streets, and you combine them yourself uh, those those uh, data sets of free the link them to uh, your name, for example, in the third. Yeah. Example. Um, so these data sets of three, those are based upon uh, APIs where you get the data. Or do you create them yourself? Um, Is there a different registry? Or? Yeah, so, so uh, at IDLab, so at IDLab, which is uh, IMAC and uh, at University, um, and I'm also glad to say University of Antwerp, all of them. Um, but at uh, University. And um, we try to, to do applied research, and we, we apply our research mainly right now in, in uh, with the, the, gov the government. So all the examples that I've shown, most of the examples I've shown are actually with the data sets in question. So they're, they're not data sets that we have in hindsight, but actually things that we said to them, like, look, this is how we think that you should publish uh, your data, and they just happen to have done it after, uh, after all this time. Like also the, the, the data of Plaza.de, which is uh, the which is already a whole set of vocabularies. They went through uh, standardization to actually get a lot of these, these, these vocabularies there. So these are the data vocabularies that are, and are then also requested in public tenders. So if they have a new system that they want to set up right now, you will need to be able to say, I'm also compliant. So also open standards for making organizations. So you need, if you want to offer an ID product right now in uh, in founders, you will need to you need that also compliance. You need to be able to show I'm using terms that are being defined uh, and uh, being defined there. So there are a couple of data sets and more and more now that are getting uh, getting published. I'm thinking about uh, local council decisions. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about traffic signs. I'm thinking about uh, mandates. Uh, I'm thinking about addresses and buildings. Uh, I'm thinking about mobility uh, These are all already available. And uh, there's actually a booth out there of the Spanish government. I'm just one fan of them because I've done a lot of work with them and they listen very carefully uh, and they collaborate, collaborate pretty well. Uh, but so there, they have a booth out there of the data that passed there. Uh, the data finding place. Is that your official term name? Is that looking at it? But, um, uh, but uh, at that booth, you'll be able to also uh, know, okay, this is how they do data discovery. And on that place, you also find a really in the data So you find the best way to take us. Uh, so in, in the beginning, you were asking, uh, you were saying about uh, the linking and the URIs. But what if I have a data set that uh, says, for example, Kent, I have this URI from the, uh, the Flemish government. But in another data set, it's Kent from Worldwide cities uh, website. What happens then? Uh, is that an issue? Uh, that's that's a, a really cool question because uh, because it's also yeah uh, uh, I teach uh, so I this morning also and it was actually one of the examples I I, I was giving the fact that you are right uh, remember I I clearly said it's uniform resource uh, identifier it's not unique and a lot of people the, the oral examination comes in and say it's a unique result of so, so I need to send them away and start with email. Because it's not a unique identifier. And on the back, you can use a lot of different identifiers, and there's a lot of good reasons to actually uh, give your own identifier to, uh, to, to, to a certain thing rather than just reusing an, an, an identifier. It is the reuse, however, of identifiers that will give you interoperability. But if you use a different one, you can still link them together. You can still also in that linking them together, you can also state how similar they are. And a great example was against the figures, in fact, because over there we had a Wikidata identifier, and we also had an identifier from uh, uh, cultural heritage, and we also had uh, an identifier from, um, uh, from uh, what was it, the, the railway infrastructure data set. They all look at gets and figures in a different way, because they also gave totally different types of it. Like uh, the, 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 the heritage uh, registry, it says that it's a building, Wikidata says that it's a railway station, and the, the, the railway infrastructure data says, uh, says that it's an operational point. So they give different accents. They give, they maybe also don't identify 100% the same thing, 
And that's a big question, right? When is something really the same as something else? I'm saying that we have really long philosophical discussions about that, like uh, to look up uh, the Zeus uh, paradox. It's like if you, if you have a shift, and then uh, bit by bit you remove every wooden uh, uh, bit of it, and you replace it by another. Is it still the same shift after all that time? That, that you're so so always identity and, and saying uh, giving an identifier to something. You're always going to get in discussions with one that you want to something. This is something like that. You can get into discussions. So it's just the question: What are we ready to, to assert for our use cases, so that we, so that in our world is how are we going to make ourselves to do it? Yeah. So uh, a, a long answer to a, a very simple question. Uh, that's no problem at all. You can just link in, uh, identifiers uh, together, and it's even a feature of something. Other questions? Hello. Uh, good afternoon. I'm audible. Sir, I'm audible. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. yes. 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 Uh, uh, my name is Pavan Dubey, and I'm from Orange uh, Telco. Uh, this use case is very common, uh, basically, in the telco industry. Like, okay, whenever we have to sell the <coughs> cable services to the customer premises, we need to make sure that uh, two things. Once, uh, one is uh, address validation, meaning the address where the shipment has to be delivered or devices have to be delivered. Uh, the address remains valid, and also on that particular address, whether uh, the feasibility of service is there or not. Meaning, on that particular location, street or uh, city, the cable services are feasible or not. 2G, 3G, 5G, uh, all the cable services are available. And we have several providers also that can make a proximus being the infrastructure over there. How do we make sure? How can we make sure uh, that this address validation takes place? Like, okay, in the data stream which you just explained. Does it also consider the address validation part? Like, what are the entries or uh, unique location IDs which you mentioned? Uh, they are uh, valid and compliant enough. So that's that's my first question. Uh, and second question is a, a very basic use case. Like, okay, uh, if two customers or uh, I mean, if two residential customers are living in the same building, so you can imagine that street name, city name, building number even will be the same. But maybe the floor is different, first floor or second floor, or even the, uh, the box number would be different. So, how would that differentiation will uh, get considered over here uh, just to make sure that the correct shipment gets delivered on the correct address, even though most of the address parameters are still the same? How do we differentiate? Yeah. Thank you. Two questions at the same time. And so, that's how can we. Uh, I'll first answer the last one. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, as I'm not, a, not an address database uh, specialist, but I would assume that uh, because they're, they're also building units in, in the address database of farmers, so I think that, that, uh, that how do you, uh, yeah, how do they disambiguate the, the, the different uh, floors of a, of, a, of a building, for example? That's with the term building units. Uh, I'd have to look, uh, look it up at data.fab.de myself in order to fully uh, grasp the data model again and to then uh, come, come to. I'm not an expert on all the vocabularies. Yes, I'm not. Yeah, we're going to. But, uh, uh, yeah, but I think the people from the address database are also here, right? So, I know, I don't know, it's me for that. Yeah, okay. Maybe they know a bit, yeah. Um, and then the first query, uh, question was uh, do I summarize it correctly if I say that, that how do I know if data is authentic, like, uh, that, that data is true? Yeah, how, yeah how, how do I know for sure that that address exists? Right. That this is really the trust component of horizontal web because if I just randomly find uh, a, a source on the web, then yeah, how do I know that I can trust it? Uh, um, my approach there is quite pragmatic at this moment. At this moment. Uh, if it's from founders.de, so founders.de, if, if, uh, if that's the source that publishes that information, and they're also actually responsible for the authoritative source, so it's in, it's in law, it's, it's a policy in law, that they are responsible in order to, to, uh, to do that. I would say that it's uh, that, that source is your best guess at, uh, at uh, the data that is correct. Of course, I think every data scientist will know that uh, that errors they uh, they occur, and you should also take that into account. Probably, uh, maybe have a kind of fact loop with the authority source in that way to that indicate. But hey, that building has been demolished. Why is it possible that that is still? Uh, All right. I think we have now still 15 minutes for a coffee break. Next door. Thank you very much, Professor Kofa.
And we have a last session in three rooms from four to five.